So the basic motivation for, for this type of work is to say, well, look, we've seen a lot of increase in women's economics and political rights. This is definitely an ongoing process. But overall, we see a general positive correlation between the expansion of women's rights and development, okay, broadly speaking. Where development, you can think of as increase in income, decreases in fertility, other indicators of development. And the question one might have is, why, are, why do we see the positive correlation? Why would you expect these things to go, you know, hand in hand? And I'm going to be examining this question from the lens of a very particular right for women, which is married women's property rights. Now, it helps that for economists, there's really nothing as important as property rights, okay? So this is not a small right, this is a big deal, okay? Just so that we're all on the same page, when I talk about property rights, I'm going to mean what's written up there, okay? legal rights to acquire, own, sell, transfer property, collect and keep rents, keep wages, make contracts, if seeking divorce, keep some of the marital assets, and also to be able to keep some of your other property, which is your biological property, your children, okay? So these were rights that were not exercised in full in Europe or in the United States until the legal systems were reformed. We're gonna be taking a historical perspective on this. And under the Roman civil law, which governed continental Europe, and under English common law, if a woman got married, she lost, if not direct ownership, then at least control over her physical property. And upon divorce, she lost guardianship over children. So it's kind of interesting because nowadays the idea that's being contested as a natural thing is for children to go with their mother if you get divorced. That's completely contested now. But back then, the idea was, the natural thing was for the children to go with their father. So it's interesting how this has uh, swung back and forth over time. So the, the particular question I'm gonna be asking is why did married women obtain property rights? And the argument that I'm gonna be making uh, is uh, very generally speaking the following. I'm gonna say that as husbands, men benefited from a patriarchal system just very generally. But as fathers, in particular as the fathers of not only boys but also of girls, they were hurt by a system that favored their son-in-laws over their daughters. The main hypothesis, and I'll t spell it out, uh, is that development exacerbates these tensions between your interests as a man, as a guy who's going to marry, and your interest as a father, as a, as a guy who has some daughters. And that these, um, these, this tension between these two interests gets exacerbated by development and ultimately resolved in favor of men as a father. Now, I'm not going to give you a psychological theory. I'm going to give you a mech an economic mechanism whereby that might happen. Okay? So the mechanism that I'm uh, thinking about is that as fertility falls or as wealth increases, what parents do, and for the fathers in particular, is to you know, take some of that increase in utility for themselves and also spread some to their future generations, okay, in particular to their children. And there's many ways you can do this, and in the model it's going to be via bequest, but you could also think about this as being general investments in their, human, in their kids' human capital, et cetera. But they, here in this model that I'll put up, they're going to do this by increasing their kids' bequests. When they do this and they try to make their kids better off, they're basically going to be favoring their sons. They're not going to be able to make their daughters easily better off because very loosely speaking, what's going to happen is that the husbands of their daughters, so their son-in-laws, are going to be extracting the extra gains that are going to their daughters. So now assume that fathers or parents in general care about some uh, maybe weighted average, which is an average over the utility of their kids. Okay. What I'm going to argue is that uh, there's going to be some critical level of wealth or some critical level of fertility at which this large disparity in the welfare of their sons relative to the welfare of their daughters is going to actually lead men to prefer a system of greater gender equality. And so they're going to be willing to give up the benefits that they get from patriarchy in order to make sure that their daughters are better treated. Okay? So that's a general argument. I'll, I'll do it. What I'll do is I'm going to show you an OLG uh, AK growth model with marriage, uh, and I'm going to compare the welfare of men under patriarchy 
versus what we can call an equal rights system. That's just a way of giving something a name. What's the difference between the two systems? Under one system, the husband is going to be making all the allocation decisions in the household. And again, loosely speaking, obtaining the surplus from marriage. Under the equal rights system, we're going to assume that the household allocation maximizes the equally weighted utility of both spouses. Now, I, I know that you had Capri uh, here earlier on in the week, and so this is going to speak directly to some of the things that he was talking about. And hopefully, you'll have some questions, some things you want to say about it. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I would say you could argue about voting rights, okay, because, you know, at least, you know, some bomb was put off in a few places. Things happened. There was a, uh, a, a movement that threatened or at least uh, looked like a rebellion. This was not accompanied by any rebellion, okay? This is definitely men giving up their power. And actually, I'll, I'm going to review the literature in two seconds, and I'll show you how the literature divides that way. But that's an excellent question. Can I ask you how I should think about homogeneticature, is that what they call it, where it's the first son, as opposed to the, I feel like it's not something you brought up, but it seems to matter with this whole average wealth. Right, no, that's, again, that's a, a, a lovely question. This happens in the U.S. and in Europe after primogeniture has been decided, been scrapped. Okay. So, you, and a, a very good question, and maybe there's one paper that I know of on that, a question, on that question is, why scrap a system of primogenitor? What was going on that, that led to it? But here, it already doesn't exist. So that's the world we're looking at. Yeah. It's already gone. And maybe the explanation for the scrap of that is in line with this. It could be in line with that. It could just be like you even care about all your sons, and now, you know, or it could be, I've always thought that an explanation, and actually an explanation that would also fit in well with this, and I have to think about how you would disentangle the two, is that what happened is that human capital becomes more important, and now you don't want to give it to any old kids, and in particular, you don't want to give it necessarily to your sons. You want to give it some to your daughters, because your daughters, human, you know, their IQ might be better than your sons, you know, just stochastically. And then you're, you're yeah, giving something to the oldest kid, would not be wise in a world in which human capital uh, matters, and giving something only to boys would also not be wise. But I haven't explored that, and I haven't thought about yet how to disentangle what the implications of those two theories would be. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so I'm going to compare these two systems. You're going to see the political economy I'm going to do is very uh, unsophisticated, and we can talk about more sophisticated versions of how to do political economy while we're at it. I don't think you have a section on political inequality uh, in this course. I think that's, uh, am I right, Steve? No, there's no, yeah. And I do think it's a very interesting issue, political inequality. It just falls more generally under the rubric, as you'll see in a few seconds when I summarize the literature, you know, why are rights granted to different groups in society? Or you know, and how, how you know how does the pol political system work to either reinforce or overturn inequalities, as it may be? But that, it's a fascinating question. I think economists actually are very good at thinking about these things, uh, and uh, yeah, you might want to keep it in mind when you're thinking about future topics to work on. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's certainly reasons of uh, Occam's razors. We're going we're gonna to have to have a model that's, we don't have to, but I'm going to be writing down a model that's trans fairly easy to work with, transparent, and emphasizes some mechanisms, perhaps at the cost of others. And um, we can go back and then talk about how that might matter. Uh, in terms of obligations of children to parents, then you have to think about contracts. You know, what are the contracts that credibly can be written between children and parents? Even today, in a much more contractual system, it's very hard to write a contract with your kids. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's the first order thing. I do think that the human capital might be an interesting thing to explore. And uh, there's another paper that looks at this from a human capital point of view. And I'll point it out in the, when we get to the lit review.
All right. The model is going to be yield uh, three main predictions, uh, predictions are with respect to fertility, wealth, and the wife's welfare. And in particular, it's going to predict that lower levels of fertility are going to be associated with earlier reform. Higher levels of wealth may not necessarily lead to uh, reform. In fact, the effects of wealth are going to be non-monotonic. When you get wealthier at first, you actually become even more in favor of patriarchy as a man, and then you switch over. Um, to becoming more and more in favor of women having more rights. Eventually, this model predicts, it's an AK growth model, so it goes on forever. It predicts that you're going to end up reforming your system. And then uh, there's, you can compare two types of, you can compare legal systems that give, treat women better or worse. And this is going to say that if you have a legal system that treats women better, those systems are actually going to reform themselves later than systems that treat women worse. Okay, I am then going to look at the predictions of the model to the extent possible uh, in the data, and what I'm going to do is use variation in the reform of property rights in the United States. Okay, so in particular, I'm going to be looking at the period 1850 through 1920, and I'm going to find a robust negative correlation between fertility and reform, and also between the existence of a legal system that gives women greater rights and the timing of reform. I'm not going to be able to find any correlation with per capita income and wealth. I have some ideas as to why that might be. And in particular, my, the theory that I'm putting up is going to predict uh, an inverted U, and you will, I can't find evidence for that. But we can, I, I'm going to try to give out some ideas as to why that might be. So one of you, I think, you back, oh yeah, go ahead. Yes. 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 And I do. Yeah. Yeah, although it is amazing, given that moral philosophy has been around such a long time, how, uh, you know, how blinkered people are to the implications of philosophical ideals to what they should be doing in their political system. You know, we're talking about a moment where we only have, you know, gay marriage has just been made legal, you know, now. So, you know, you could think, well, why weren't they at this, you know, 300 years ago? So. In, and like that, certainly uh, civil rights for many, many groups. But I, I, I will control for education for slightly different reasons than, one, than the ones you're bringing up, but you might believe your, your point too. Sorry, Steve, did you have a point? Right. I mean, I think that I, I've I've always found it a uh, very interesting issue. When I mm, I was when I was brought up, my father would t ask me would say, "Well, look, why didn't they abolish slavery when you had the ancient Greeks? Okay, they they had slaves. It certainly understood the moral inconsistencies of having slavery, but there's also a certain economic benefit from having slaves. And I do think you know you're living to you're willing to live with contradictions and not examine the implications of arguments till there's a big political uh, there's there's an advantage to you to do that or it's not so disadvantageous so i do think that these i do think i don't know why race versus not race makes it better it's true they were often prisoners of war sure, but, um, if but you're black, Yeah, I, I don't want, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure that it's useful for us to say which one was better, which one was worse. All I'm just, and I don't know, even, you know, that's not a choice that anyone had, but I do think that it was inconsistent with their ideals. Sure, sure. So I, I just want to 
point that I think it's very easy, it's quite easy for people to live with inconsistency in ideals. But we, in any case, this paper won't. We could argue about that, but uh, in any case, I will control for education when it comes to some of the regressions, and it'll survive that. Okay, so if, if I guess more, let me try to give you a little bit of overview just in terms of political economy literature, since I'm only going to be looking at part of it here. There's two types of, you know, broadly speaking, you can say why do things change politically, and you, aside from the argument that you gave right now, which is that we come to our senses. There's usually two points of view. Either a group threatens you. Okay, so you were asking, you know, why, why, you know, weren't women threatening in some sense the established order? Or you find it in your own, the, the group that has control of the power finds it in its own interest to give up some of that power. Okay? And I'm differentiating between the two in the sense that it might be in your interest to give up power because you're threatened. That's not what I'm. That's not the way the liter I'm dividing the literature. I'm dividing it into threat versus independently of any threat. There's changes in the environment that make it advantageous for you to give up your power. Okay, so that's a way. In some sense, you can look at many issues. And in the area of rights that are conceded because it makes those in power better off, we have several papers in the literature. That what matters here is, by the way, is not that the rights are conceded because it makes people better off. That's a very, very general statement. But rather, the actual mechanism that's at work that makes that makes this work. Okay, yeah. So I don't know enough because I haven't worked on that area. Uh, so I'm just, I'm going to give you a very cursory summary of this literature. This is not something I know about. For, for, for your case, yeah. It depends what you mean by a huge amount. If by a huge, and what we're losing. If you, this is going to be a welfare argument and not an, an if, and slightly an inefficiency argument, but it's not an inefficiency of production. It's not, oh, our women could be out working productively and gaining wages if only they were able to own property. Okay. That's not the argument. Yeah, I don't mean to get too far ahead, but I mean, you would imagine there would be some kind of, so this isn't going to explain the US, you would explain actual debates within the house. Yeah, there's not much debates, and I will get to, I've looked at the literature, you know. I, so I've read like m ladies' magazines and see what they're saying, and I, I can tell you a little bit about it, but not, not too, too much. And I'm already a little bit worrying about time, but I've been told you want to stay here for hours and hours, and we can be here till midnight. Okay. All right. So, uh, no, actually, do interrupt. Uh, so, abolition of slavery, this is very contested. Some people say it's because of an inefficiency, some people say no. Uh, but in any case, uh, at least a fo uh, there's a famous argument put forward by Fogel and Angerman that the abolition of slavery happens because it's inefficient. Okay, so it's inefficient. Why? Because you know, it's, if, if you have to monitor people to work, uh, then you're not going to be doing things. You're not going to get getting the. Uh, you're not going to be at the first pass relative to if you can rent the land out to them, and they can come and work in your land, because now they have the incentives are aligned. Okay, and they're going to be working. So it's a classic argument that was made for slavery. There is various different arguments which I won't go through for the suffrage extension. Suffrage extensions is probably the issue that has received most attention in the literature because you can study empirically. Uh, and it's because it's a fascinating question too. So as over time you see suffrage, suffrage for those of you, not everybody speaks perfect English, is the ability to vote. So um, 
you know, you see that extended, you know, but there's a literacy requirement, there's a wealth requirement, there's a color of skin requirement, there's a gender requirement over time. There's an age requirement over time. Each of these uh, gets loosened, gets dropped, okay, becomes less constrictive. So that's a very interesting question. And so the, some people have focused on different, you know, people have focused on different things. Uh, and they've basically, all the literature that I'm citing here has made the argument that it was because of inefficiency. As I said, what matters is really the mechanism, and I'm not going to go through the mechanisms made by each one of them. Uh, there's an argument made for our universal education. You know, why do we have universal education? Well, you know, firms, I, that's the one I remember, so I can get it to you. Firms, uh, firms have, uh, would like to have educated workers, and they can invest in their workers. But when they invest in their workers, their workers are free to quit and go to other firms. And so all that investment that they've made in their workers doesn't pay off. So that's a problem that each firm faces. Okay, so what we can do, let's think of it as capitalists, what we can do is we can institute a, a system of universal education, and now we're no longer worried about people poaching on each other's workers. Okay, so now we've, we've solved that problem. There's child labor laws, who's being helped, who's being hurt. And then for the particular issue that we're looking at today, which is women's economic rights, there's two uh, papers that I'm going to talk about, and these are the only two papers that I know. One is a paper by Geddes and Luke. Um, and what Geddes and Luke do is they don't have a formal model, but they're basically making the same inefficiency effort argument as in slavery. And they say that there's an inefficiency uh, of having women not own property. And this inefficiency is increasing with the amount of capital. And then they look at this cross-state variation uh, of timing of legislation that gave married women property rights in the United States. So exactly the same data set as I'm using. In fact, I have their data set. So, and they find a positive correlation between per capita wealth at the state level and the timing of uh, women's property rights in the United States. Uh, I'm going to show that this correlation is not robust to introducing a key variable, and particularly fertility. I'm also going to argue, I guess just conceptually, that it's hard to believe the argument because women in this period, particular white married women over most of this time period, are work under 10% of them are in the labor force. Okay? So it's really hard to know what it is that women are doing inefficiently. I mean, you could say the meatloaf at home is not being done with as much tender care as it should be as she was getting a wage. But she's not really getting to keep that property. All right, so it's not clear what that inefficiency would be. Uh, and in any case, it, it's not going to hold up empirically. Dopke and Turtle have a, a, a nice, very nice paper um, where they basically uh, make a different argument. So I'm going to go talk to you at length about this argument because it's going to be useful for what I have to say later on. And also, I just think it's a generally interesting thing to understand when you're trying to think about households. So Capri was talking to you about households. And I think that probably when he talked to you, he talked to you about a household that was already formed, mostly, right? And looking at decisions and, you know, can you think about it as, as a, I forget now, the, uh, you know, as a one person versus, you know, is it a bargaining problem? How should we think about the household? But, you know, prior problem, which they've also worked on a bit, uh, is how do people get married? How do the households get formed in the first place? And it really does matter how you, uh, m in general, not for my paper, but in general, it matters a lot how you model matching, okay, in a marriage market. And it's something that you really do have to think about if you're going to deal at all with gender, or if you're actually really, if you can deal about with almost any issue, it, it might, you know, the way people pair up in households, particularly to anyone who's interested in socioeconomic inequality, is a huge thing, okay? So I've, I've done work before on how people sort into marriages and what the consequences of that might be for human capital. But right now, I just want you to think about just, you know, let's forget about those, those issues for a second. Let's just think about people getting married at random. So what happens when people get married at random? In general, there's going to be a strong underinvestment result in, uh, in, if there's a public good that they have to invest in. And the reason, so let, let's think about it this way. Um, 
I'm going to pick on you, Nicholas. Your parents have to invest in your education, OK? And when they invest about in your education, they're going to think about how, you know, how your education makes you better off in terms of your, you know, how happy you're going to be, your wages, et cetera. Um, but if you're going to be matching at random in the marriage market, one thing that they don't think about is how happy is your education going to make your spouse? Or how happy is your education going to make your spouse's parents? So in general, when they're thinking about what the optimal level of education is, they're ignoring the, the contribution of your education to a few other people's utility. And because of that, there's a strong underinvestment result. Okay. Now, when would, just, to, uh, just so that we all stay awake and on the same page, when do you think that result might go away? You know, there was, I just gave an argument for why you would underinvest in education. Well, <laughs> it could be. So what made you say that? It could be. It's no longer random. OK, and, and, and in particular, how? Yeah, and actually, that's a very, you know, it's nice that you say that, because I actually don't know anyone who's looked at, you know, like investment in education, assuming that education is prized, rather than, say, beauty of the girls or fertility, fecundity of the girls, that, you know, that, that you would tend to see more where there's matches that are made. But in general, it, you're, you're completely right. Anything that's going to be, and you too, uh, Isabel, <laughs> that anything that's going to make you more valuable, if that gets priced in somehow, we're really what we're doing with that price is we're pricing in the utility of others from the fact that you're getting a higher education or, Nicholas, that your parents are investing more in you. So um, if we go to the other extreme, give me one second, if we go to the other extreme of a perfectly competitive um, marriage market, and there's strong conditions for that to be perfectly competitive, so everybody has to be a price taker. Everybody has to be substitutable. It can't be that there's only one Ana Reynoso around, and you know, if she turns you down, that's it. You're devastated. There's always someone else who looks exactly like her who will, you know, for the right price, basically <laughs> say yes. Okay, <laughs> all right. So this is, you know, that's you need, and you need, a, you know, you need a thickness of the market. You need the usual things that we need for perfect competition. Okay, yeah. Right, 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 right. So every so you, and you're right, and people are very cognizant of the fact that there's, since there's fewer women around, that will make women more valuable. You know, unfortunately, it hasn't really kicked in in terms of you know putting a large stop to the uh, to the gender imbalance. You know, so it takes seems to take a long time for people to understand that. Uh, my daughter's Chinese, so you know, I, say, I certainly understand those things myself. Um, it, takes a long, uh, it takes a long time. And I, I mean, one interest, fascinating area, I think, for research is actually thinking about not just the general outcome, which is that men are going to be investing more because they're going to be competing for scarce wives, but try to think about different facets of marriage m models. And one might make different predictions than another, and which one would be borne out in the data. I think that would be a fascinating thing to study. Uh, and you know, people are just beginning. Uh, you know, a lot of development in economics is done by people. This is going to be live, so this is going to be aired. I shouldn't say that. So I'm just saying that people who do <laughs> I love random controlled experiments. But uh, <laughs> I do, I do. No, but you know, a lot of the times you don't, you end up you know, not necessarily thinking maybe sufficiently about uh, various la levels of theory that you might want to be testing. Uh, OK. All right. So uh, OK. So that was a whole big introduction to say, Tom can turn a look at a random matching in a marriage market, which leads to underinvestment in children's education, because they're matching on random. And the kid's education is basically acting as a public good, or has this public good feature. And women care more about kids. And if it were up to them, they would invest more in the kids' education. 
The problem is that women don't make decisions <coughs> in their world, okay? Just like they won't make decisions in my world when they're under a patriarchal system. And what ha when technolo technological change occurs, such that as to increase the return to education, what men do in their model is to voluntarily give up rights and uh, let women have more of a say. So one way you can think about it is that uh, each, just like before, each firm wanted more educated workers, but didn't find it in their own interest. This, is, this underinvestment problem is not something you, you can cure by yourself as a father. You can realize that kids are under, being underinvested in, but you, your problem is that your daughter or your son is going to not have a sufficiently high, high human capital um, spouse. That's an underinvestment problem that can't be cured by an individual. When all the women get to have a say in how much education to give their kids, since male and female preference are by assumption asymmetric, and there's at least a bit of evidence that that might be true, then that helps to cure this underinvestment problem in education. So that's the argument in that paper. And why wouldn't it be so that the fact that men realize that technological change increases returns to education, that changes their preferences for their kids' education? It, it might change how much they do for education, and I forget the exact trick in the model, that it increases the inefficiency. It can go either way, but it increases. It's not that they keep the same level of investment. It's just that the inefficiency becomes more important. It doesn't have to, it does. Oh, because they, no, by themselves they don't find, they, they don't find it. So in, in one sense you're right, in the sense that, and that would be my criticism, is why not simply introduce a system of mandatory education? So that's kind of like what the firms did. The firm said, let's there be mandatory education. So this is what men could do. <coughs> Forget about giving rights to their wives. Let's introduce a system of mandatory education. Uh, they can't do it themselves because they have the, with their preferences, it doesn't make sense. I mean, they might invest more or less, but they're still under investment, under investing from a, a first best point of view. And they're aware of that, but there's nothing as an individual they can do from that perspective. So they're aware of this criticism that you might want a system of mandatory education and that would cure all these problems. So what they argue is something that's plausible, which is assume that the formation of human capital, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of human capital models uh, these last few days, assume that the formation of human capital has two arguments. One of them is your formal education system, so what you could get by mandating more, you know, more education. And the other would be parental investment in your human capital. And assume that these are complements in the production, so the cross partial is positive. Okay? And then they argue that the same, the same thing would go true, it, it, it would go through. It's not enough that you do the formal education, you also want to change, this, uh, you also want to give women more of a say in the education of their kids. And you want everybody else to, to do the same. And that's why you give women more rights. And what I'm going to show is just an empirical point. This is not theory. It's just that there's no empirically significant correlation between the reform of the political system to giving women more rights and formal education. And in particular, the, uh, the introduction of mandatory education or measures such as schooling. OK? So I'll, I'll show you that. Yeah. In, in Dopke and Turtled? Yeah. In Dopke and Turtled, no. There's no heterogeneity as an equilibrium. That's simply everybody starts out identical. Let's say, say identical. It's not that the matching market becomes more competitive. It stays, stays by assumption random. It's just that you have a commitment device to, for more education, and that's women. Women care intrinsically more about education, assumption. They care intrinsically, uh, actually they, they, they care more about their children. It's not, sorry, I shouldn't say. They care more about their children than the men do. And consequently, they invest more in education. So by giving women rights, which is synonymous here with uh, having women make decisions alongside with you in the household, you are committing yourself to 
not only yourself, you're committing everybody else around you, that's the important thing, to giving more education to your kids. Uh, yeah, is that? There's no heterogeneity, but I'm not, sh uh, yeah, this result with random matching, the heterogeneity is not going to be helpful because you're still at random, so it's not getting priced in. You need a price mechanism, and the question is, what's the price mechanism in a marriage market? With random matching, by assumption, there's zero prices, and then you can talk about various levels of competition and what that does. Uh, questions? Okay. Um, all right, so just general evidence, the, the, the basic mechanism I'm talking about here is a mechanism of paternalism. Paternalism really meaning what paternalism means, okay? <laughs> That's not a good sentence, but I mean that fathers care about their kids, okay? They're potters. They care about their kids, and they care, uh, in particular, they also care about their girls. And from that perspective, it's nice that we know, we at least have them direct empirical evidence that voting preferences and the behavior of politicians is influenced by the proportion of children that are girls. So it does seem that it makes a difference, for example, to have girls versus boys. It does seem to influence what people do. So Banya Washington has a very nice paper. It was her job market paper, and she looked at the congressional voting records. And she found that conditional on total number of kids, the larger the proportion of, of of uh, girls that you have out of that total number, the more likely the politician is to vote l liberally or if you'd like fa in favor of women's issues. Okay, so they use coding of other people that have done on you know when something is an important issue for women that's up for vote, and then they look at the, at the records. It's a very nice paper. Also, and part of me, uh do something uh, a slightly weaker thing. It's it's more of a survey. They use British Household Panel Survey data to examine preferences towards political parties in the UK. And again, given a constant family size, parents with girls, with more girls, are more likely to vote either for the, you know, for, I was going to say Social Democrats, I'm in the wrong country, for Labour or for the Liberal Party than for the Conservatives. Okay. And also, I think they've updated their paper to, it's now published, to include Germany as well. Okay, so that was a very long introduction. Let me give you a little bit more background in terms of the U.S. So the majority of U.S. states base their marital laws on, US, on English common law. And what the English common law says is uh, very romantic. It says that people are one when they get married. Okay, which is a nice thought. But of course that one that you are is your husband. Okay, <laughs> and obviously there's going to be certain things that immediately follow from that. Because if you, when that means that it should you as a married woman try to get into a contract, since you are your husband, you are entering your husband into a contract, okay? And you might worry about that happening, okay? You're now you're entering someone else. So uh, that was one of the reasons that it was said, you know, you, you can't have women, married women entering into contracts, because she's implicitly entering her husband. The symmetric, of course, is always true. The husband was entering the wife, but they weren't as worried about that one. Okay, so under 19th century common law, uh, these were the rules of coverture. They, they operate under common law. They also operated under Roman-based laws, so the, the ones that govern in continental Europe as well. Uh, under coverture, husband controlled his wife's property, his wife's earnings. As I said, married women couldn't enter into contracts except with the consent of their husbands. And should you get divorced, which is very rare back then, then the kids went to the dad. Okay. Um, I'm now going to take you through a model. I'm going to assume you're really fascinated by theory. And then I'm going to take you through some empirics, and we'll see how we get, and we can go faster or slower. And maybe uh, Steve can give me a hint as to how fast or slow to go through different parts. OK, that's good. OK, there's no lions, though, that can come out of these different things, right? No. All right. Uh, so let's, my, everything's really going to be taking that place in the married household. So let's think of a married household as a husband H, a wife W, and they have two N kids. And everything is nice and symmetric. There's N boys and there's N girls, and fertility is exogenous throughout. Okay? And everybody has the same preferences here. Okay? So they all care about their own consumption, which is the CI, 
and they have log preferences over it, and then they care about the discounted value of their kids' average utility. So here's the 2N kids, and there is uh, N boys. This is the prime is telling you it's the boy in the future. The H is because he's, a boy is going to be a future husband. And the same thing for the girl. Okay, so this is the average utility of boys, average utility of girls, and already inside this concept is the idea that you're always going to treat all your boys equally, and you're going to treat all your girls equally, and concavity makes that true, so we're not going to worry about it, okay, because there's nothing else like ability or anything else that's making boys different or girls differently. That doesn't mean you treat all your boys equal to your girls, it's just that all the boys get treated the same, all the girls get treated the same, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a strong assumption because otherwise you can't solve it. You, you can solve it numerically. You can solve models numerically here, but you wouldn't be able to do it. So basically, there's, so modeling is an art, and there's certain things you can put in and certain things you put out. So you can go for human capital and fertility, and that's not hard to do. Uh, or you can go for physical capital, uh, and, you know, bequests and not fertility, and I decided to go for bequests and not fertility. Um, I did some simulations of models of endogenous fertility, but that's just, you know, yeah. In the end, it's an empirical issue. But here, I'm going to, it's going to be a problem when I come to the empirics, in fact, because I'm going to have to say, well, what makes the fertility across states different? I won't have more, uh, much of an argument for that, which is why, in the end, it's going to be a correlation rather than causality. But then I'm going to do something weaker than an instrument. I'm probably the only person who calls something like that a proxy. And I'm, I'm going to proxy for this variable. And then I'm going to show you at least, I think, some explanations we can rule out. And then Steve will probably disagree. And then we'll talk about it. <laughs> OK. All right. So OK, so that's their utility function. And, uh, you know, a household is going to begin married life with some inherited capital, capital from the boy and capital from the girl. And all that they're going to do is they're going to take that capital, put it together, and let's call that K, the, t the sum of the, the girl's capital and the boy's capital. These are their bequests. This is what their parents gave them, okay? And they're going to produce, and here's the AK part of the model. They produce AK units of output come out. And then they decide how to allocate that between consumption of the husband, consumption of the wife, uh, investments, uh, bequests to their boys, and bequests to their girls. And that's it in terms of the model. It's very simple. The timing of the model is that individuals go to the marriage market, then, and they get married, and then they, they go with their bequests, and then they have children and consume and bequeath. And this keeps on going on forever. OK. OK, so let me speak two words about the marriage market. Um, so I told you a bit about how random matching works. Here I'm going to take exactly the opposite assumption, which is a perfect competition assumption. And actually, the results go through with both of them, both assumptions. Uh, this is actually easier to work with, and it has the virtue or whatever of having one less inefficiency in this model. But yeah, so I saw a hand somewhere. Yeah. No, right now we're, we're not there yet. Uh, we just say, you know, you as a guy, as a father, you have, or as a man, you have preferences over your own consumption, and you also care, that's log, and you care about the discounted value of your children's utility. Uh, I can't see this anymore here. Does it, uh, is there a way to put it up here? If not, I can live, but I'm going to be going like this. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So, um, so, all right. So we're going to have perfect competition, and when you have, you know, these results I think are still not a hundred percent clear or understood. So I, I, I would also say there's room for work here. 
when there's perfect competition, there's going to exist an equilibrium. It's not necessarily unique. We have efficient investment in the public good. Um, what's an equilibrium? When you, people go to, the match, uh, to be matched in marriage, an equilibrium is simply going to be assignment of individuals to one another such that you cannot find another two individuals that could rematch and marry one another and make themselves better off, at least one of them strictly better off. So we'll call an equilibrium or a stable match an allocation of people to each other such that you can't find two people who want to switch to marry one another. Okay, and you could, that could include being single. Okay, uh, and I'm just going to rule out singlehood by making sure that the utility of marriage is large enough. So if it isn't large enough, I th just throw in a huge positive constant. Okay, just want to make sure people want to get married. Okay. Um, what kind of contracts can you run, right? Well, you, the important thing is that you can't write contracts. And in particular, you can't, write con you can't as a father, have your son-in-law write a contract saying, this is how you're going to treat the daughter, or I will give you more, I will give my daughter a larger bequest if you treat my daughter better. And one way to think about it is, actually those are hard contracts to write today. Um, uh, there'd be no enforcement, and it was very hard back, you know, think about the 1800s, that would be even harder to be writing back then. But basically, you're not allowed to make uh, contingent contracts on your, the utility of your spouse, uh, the utility of your child. Okay. All right, so now I just want to show you something that's a useful trick to know, which is how do you solve for an efficient equilibrium? Okay, an efficient... Uh, Okay, so uh, the way to do it is, you know, you want people to be investing the right amount in their kids. So here it's physical capital. You want people to be giving the right amount of bequests to their kids, okay, because that's what it would mean for it to be efficient here. And what we're going to do is we're going to assign siblings as spouses to one another, okay? So I have to say it. Again, that this is a solution method. It is not a description of the market. Okay, so it's not that their brothers and sisters are marrying one another because I do get people confused, including referees. <laughs> you know, they are not marrying one another. It's just a solution method. That is, if you want to know, you know, this is just like when we do the social planners problem, we don't think there's a social planner out there. I hope none of you do. Uh, so this is the same thing. It's just a way to figure out what the efficient allocation is. Okay, so let's just to make sure you're paying attention, why might that help me? Why is that a good way to maybe solve this if I'm trying to figure out what the efficient allocation is? Why would it be good to allocate spouses, siblings as spouses? Right, but yeah, but spell it out. You're right, but now I want you to spell it out because that has to be true. Yeah. So no, that that but that's that's exactly right. So what is happening is that if maybe I'll show you with the maximization problem. How's that? What's happening is that um, I can't find my pointer now. But here, uh, okay. What's happening is one one way that you can think about the uh, the maximization problem is that uh, you would be. If, you would be maximizing the log of consumption, that's your, the man's utility, and then the discounted value uh, of the average, so that's what that two is doing, of boys' and girls' utilities. But now when you invest in your boy, K prime H, you don't just take the derivative of the utility of the boy, but you take into account that the boy is marrying the girl, and therefore K prime H shows up in her utility function. So now you're taking directly into account the fact that when you make the boy better off, you're also making his wife better off. And so now you're pricing it in and vice versa. Okay? So that's why we're writing something which looks a little bit weird, which is we're writing the investments to the other sibling directly in the uh, value function okay? of, of, of each one. Okay? And again, it's just a solution method. Okay. 
So, yeah. All right, so let me just take you through one of them, quick, uh, and then I'll take you through the other one much quicker. So what a patriarchal decision regime does is that the husband is going to make allocation decisions. And none of you asked me an important question, which is what is happening to the consumption level of his wife. Okay? And in particular, there's a really stark assumption being made here, which is obviously, by introspection, could not be true, which is that spouses don't care about one another. Okay? They don't care about the utility of their, kid, of, of, of their, of their spouse. So a log of his own consumption and then his kids, but nothing about his spouse. And that's going to be, I'll talk about that later on, but what, we're gonna, what he would like to do is give her zero. Of course, log zero is a very ugly thing, so we're not going to allow that to happen. And instead, we're going to say, look, you, you, you know, the legal system, you, you have to give her some minimum. Okay? And we're going to set that minimum to C lower bar. And that's an important number uh, thing, because when, when we're doing exercises about the regimes, regimes being more or less generous towards married women, what we're going to think about is doing comparative statics on that. Okay? So uh, we can solve. I'm going to take us a little bit quicker through that. We can solve for the, oh, the, relationship, the recursive relationships that the value functions have to um, respect. And uh, in general, how many of you know how to do that? And how you do that? And I'm like, don't worry, I'm not going to teach a class on that. So how, how many of you know how to do that? You've all been, you're all like past, past your first year, right? So how do you do that? Forget about how many of you. How, do you, how does one solve these type of models? Huh? This is an infinite horizon overlapping generations, or I forget about the overlapping, but there's, yeah, yeah. So I, right, and this is, this is not a fixed point here, because this is an AK model. There's not, there's not something stationary here. You can try a? You could try a logarithmic solution. So you know, there's various ways. You, you, you can do approximations, and then you take various approximations. Or you can really be a good guesser. Okay? There's very few things that we know how to solve in closed form. And this, you know, I you know, finally ended up guessing what the right answer was. But it's not anything. And that's, you know, that's the problems with solving these type of models. That's why when somebody, I think you in the back, uh, I can't see your name, Maximilian, you were asking me about fertility. It's very hard to actually, I could not find a solution doing this with endogenous fertility. Um, and so you can do this, and it's, you know, you're going to end up with some solution for the value function for the husband, the value function for, hus uh, uh, function for the wife. And it's going to be log linear, but not in capital, but rather in this transformation of the capital stock. Okay? And you see all the variables from the model, the, the C lower bar that you have to give the wife, A, which comes from the AK model, and N, which is the number of kids divided by two. Okay? All right. Um, I'm going to impose two conditions on this economy, because one thing that you may notice is that this might be a negative number if I don't impose conditions on the economy, and that would not be good. So I'm going to put some, some conditions on the economy, which is also going to make those value functions correct. And the two conditions I'm going to put are actually very sensible economic conditions. So the kind of the theory even calls for them. One is to say, look, since we're studying a patriarchal regime, the husband should be at least as well off at the start of time. OK, so whenever we're starting off this world, let's call it T-naught, the husband should be at least as well off as his wife. Otherwise, you know, it kind of doesn't make sense. So that just means that his consumption should be higher than C lower bar. And that just gives us a lower bound on how poor this economy can be. So that's the K naught. And then if you notice, the right-hand side is just a constant. So we don't want that to be violated at any point in time. If we want that the husband always be better off than the wife, one way to guarantee it is to say, well, K should not be falling. And in fact, K should be increasing over time. So I'm going to impose that the economy grows over time. And again, and historically, the economy was growing over time. And again, that's just a, a relationship among all the constants in this um, model. And basically, it's saying that the economy has to be sufficiently productive relative to the number of kids uh, that one has. So that when you, you have K, you do AK to it, you redistribute it to your children, there's enough left over so that the economy is actually growing. OK, so that's what the regime looks like. Uh, uh, let me now describe the equal rights regime. 
The equal rights regime, all marital property is jointly owned. Actually, I should say one more thing. Um, I wrote everything as a function of K, okay? And not K that goes to the boy or K that goes to the girl. And in fact, this model has no distributive implications for how much investment you want to do in boys relative to girls. So since we're all paying attention, why is that? Why, why can't I write everything in, in terms of K, which is the total amount of capital, rather than capital to boys versus capital to girls? I was going to do my clicker at you. They're yeah. each other. OK, but that's not enough. They're not necessarily one happy family here. No, no, but you're right. It's because they're marrying each other and one more thing. Well, you, you, David? OK, you took my class. All right. <laughs> but I did tell you to speak up. All right, so go ahead. No. In fact, it's not linear because we have log k over it. There, the, 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 the investment is linear in k. Uh, the consumption is linear in K, but their value functions are not, they're log linear in K, but that's not. Huh? Who's choosing K? The father. Yes, and, and not only is he choosing, I mean, it's, it's because of father, but when the father gives it to you, you're the boy. Right, but what gets him to value the sum of it? There's an important assumption being made here, which is. Oh, the power is going to the husband. So one of the things that we avoided here, which is something that might interest you a lot, and I think a lot of interesting work needs to be done, but it needs to be done with some empirical evidence, is a whole bargaining problem of the household, okay? And what's missing is empirical evidence. I'm going to say that again, okay? I mean, we have empirical evidence from things like Progressa. It does matter if you give something to a wife relative to uh, the husband, okay? So there, there we know something matters, okay? We, we, but there's very little... We don't have very much knowledge about what sort of a bargaining game is going on. So in particular, if you give an extra $100 to the wife, how much is going to be going on things that she cares about relative to him? Okay, and what does that depend on? So we don't have that much, you know, people have not done much with that. Why do we care about VW in the first place? We need VW to solve the model because he cares about his daughters. So one VW of K is his wife. But if you put a K prime, it's his daughter. OK, so that's why we need to solve it. Um, OK, so the reason that K is indeterminate here is because only the total capital that's brought to the family matters. Why? Because a man is going to take his capital, her capital, produce of it, and allocate it as he sees fit. So it's the fact that we gave all the power to the man that makes us not have to worry about anything. And of course, that has a price in terms of the richness of the model. But in, in any case, you would not have been able to look at the empirics of this, which is that you can't say anything about like bequests to daughters versus sons. And I tried to start looking at this evidence. And back then, it's really impossible to look at this evidence, although you know, people should try. Um, what else do I want to say? So I just want to make sure you understand the strategies in the, in, in the marriage market. Anybody have an idea of how, what the strategies in the marriage market look like? So it's all kind of a little bit now hidden behind the scenes. But there's this competitive marriage market going on. But everybody looks the same. Uh, suppose that the, let's, let's be clear. Suppose that the efficient amount of capital to bring, to, to give to your kids is 10, whatever 10 might mean, 10. What this is saying is you can divide it as 7-3. Seven, 7 goes to boys and 3 goes to girls. How would that be supported in a marriage market? Does that, can anybody think of what strategies support that? I, I, have, if you have, I think you've all had green theory. Can you think about, so this, you, you might want, you need to think about strategies now. What, what would support that? Suppose you, your father, you know, Alexandros, gives you six instead of seven. The marriage market is expecting you to bring seven. Your father gives you six. What happens? It's a competitive marriage market. So instead of marrying to a woman of value seven, I'll need to marry to a woman of value six if he or she was sort of replacing. Right. Uh, but but uh, there's everybody here looks the same. All the women came to the capital market with three units of capital. All the boys came to the market with seven units of capital. Your father made a mistake and brought, gave you six. I stay single. 
you stay single. So what's the strategies? Sorry, what are the strategies that support that? Just, just to be clear. Competitive, competitive. Just think of them infinitesimal. So I should have said that. Now, thank you very much. Part of the important ideas of, of when I was trying to say that there's lots of people that look like Anna. What I meant is also it's you know she's atomistic. There's a lot of people who look like her, and she has no mass. She has no mass. <laughs> Sorry, Anna. That means you don't have to diet. All right. No, no, his father made a mistake. I just want us to understand the strategies. It won't happen in equilibrium, but his father made a mistake. So his father deviates. He says, ah, you know, these guys are not economists. I'm going to deviate. I'm going to give him six. I'm going to eat some more myself. So what's the problem? The problem is he, nobody's going to marry him. Why? All the women are insisting on seven. There is no woman who's going to stay single because Alexandras doesn't get married. That's the beauty of infinitesimal, OK? You've got to remember that, OK? So then Alexandra doesn't get married, and you know there's nobody called the Ludis anymore, which may be a very bad thing or a good thing. Okay, My Greek pronunciation is really bad. No OK. <laughs> All right. I got it right? All right. OK. Yeah, my sister's married to a Greek-American, so that's my <laughs> Greek showing. Um, OK. All right, so those are the strategies or trigger strategies. They say, unless your husband brings out, the guy brings at least this much, don't marry him. Unless the woman brings at least this much, don't marry her. Infinitesimal, it all works out. Trigger strategies. And that's why a lot of things can be supported. Okay, and if you have more of a theory about why, how bad is it to be single, that's going to cut down the amount that can be supported. And if you have a competitive market, that's going to make things much harder because now you, can, you just fall a bit instead of being left single. OK? But in, so these are really nice things to play with. I mean, I think they're beautiful in general. This is not a particularly beautiful one in that it's very stark. But it, they're, they're very nice. They're not, I would say, not completely understood at all. You know, like what makes a model going to work and what it's not going to work. And uh, yeah, you know, yeah, we're in Chicago. This is, you know, so we're, we're still kind of all working off the Becker marriage market and doing some deviations from it. Yeah. No, not in this model. Yeah. Yeah. And gets in digestion, but yeah. Yeah. No. No, she, she brings it to the market and then, you know, they get married. Right. I mean, a more sophisticated model where you were bringing this to the computer would have some women staying single and you might have theories about who stays single and who doesn't. And those would be all interesting things. And by the way, this is a good moment to talk about like where research needs to be done. You know, the, the whole marriage patterns and how they're changing. I, I, don't, I don't mean just things like cohabitation, but who is it who remains single and who is it who gets married? And the men, it's the bottom that remains single. At the women, in the women, it's still the top, like at the top, top. Okay? Uh, that's self serving, but yeah. And, and then you can ask, you know, it's, so it seems like it's the best of the women and the worst of the men. And you know, it's, it's just very interesting to think about these things and how it's changed over time. Okay? Uh, and again, I would say that, that there's some research going on, definitely, especially people who are interested in household economics. But there needs to be more done. And then the implications of that for anything that concern anyone, children, inequality, everything is really going to follow from that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to zip through the equal rights regime. Under the equal rights regime, all marital property is jointly owned. And we're just going to assume that what, what, what the couple does is to put equal weight on husband and wife. None of this really matters. It could be a weight of two thirds on the husband, one third on the wife. The point is she's getting more weight than she used to. OK, she was getting a weight of zero. Now she'd be getting a positive weight. Let's just give them equal weight. And so this is now the, cons the, uh, the problem they face. They solve the log of his, maximize the log of his consumption, her consumption, and now they both care about the kids, which is why the two that used to be in the denominator has disappeared. Here's the same budget constraint as before, and that's it. And then for those of you who do macro, you will recognize this model as one of the few models we know how to solve in macro, an AK growth model with log consumption. 
The one thing that you may not be used to is having two people, a husband and a wife in the, in the family, and also having end kids. Okay, but this is one of the few macro models that we can solve and close for. Okay, so, and it's, it's nice, it's easy, it's log k, the value function, and you have a nice investment in consumption rule. Consumption is some fraction of a k. Uh, investment in kids, efficient, is also some fraction of a k. And be, as before, only, uh, only the total amount of capital is determinate. Not how much you give to boys relative to how much you give to girls. So again, just to make sure you weren't asleep, why is that? It was true before, it's true now. Why, why can't we determine how much goes to a boy versus how much goes to a girl? Sorry, said. So no, nope. it could be that in equilibrium you are, you know, how much you give to boys versus girls matters. And if you gave different fractions, you know, different things would happen. In equilibrium, you wouldn't. But here, it's how much you give to boys versus girls is not determined. It's not pinned down in equilibrium. How much you have to give 10. But how you divide that 10 between boys and girls is not pinned down by the equilibrium. Why not? Because what? I am just choosing K because I know that it's not pinned down. But tell me why. <laughs> yeah. Every household gives K and every household receives K. Everybody's married. That's not enough. Maybe it's that they're giving, uh, they're married to each other and also they care equally about the welfare of their sons and daughters. So thus they, there's no, because it's equal weight, it does it. Even if they had different preferences, that would be true. Uh, nope. Nope. The, who's deciding here? Who's deciding? I'm not sure that the two models are not observationally equivalent. I think that the two models are observationally equivalent and they both collapse the unitary model. No, 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 no. no. One just individual uh, making choice because in this case it seems as if um, we care about, uh, you know, both spouses' utility, but, but these are not price-dependent preferences. So actually it collapses to the unitary model, which is... What we well, this is a unitary model. This right now, here, the way it's written, it's as though it were a unitary model. Which is right. Right. The previous case. Right. So but, but now give me the... Yeah, and you're absolutely right. But give me the... It's just one someone makes the choice. Right. Because, it, well, because there's no bargaining. There's no so bargaining. that's what I wanted to hear. It doesn't matter who brings in seven relative to three because seven is not giving you any difference in the allocations to consumption relative to, you know, the investment you do in kids. And even if you had different preferences, it wouldn't because we're just saying we're solving this efficiently. And so how much you're bringing in is, not, is, is being treated as irrelevant to this problem. So just before it was true because we had the extreme of the husband making all the decisions. Now it's true because we're just saying we're going to give them some weight. It turns out it's equal, but it doesn't matter if it's equal or not. We're giving them some weight, and the allocation maximizes that. And who's bringing it in doesn't change the outcome. So since who's bringing in doesn't change the outcome, from an efficiency point of view, all we care about is 10. 10 does matter. You have to give them 10 units. Now give it 7, 3, 5, 5, whatever way you want. Just give them 10 units. Is this, sorry, sir? No, I mean, no, it's because, it's because we're not allowing the outcomes to depend on initial ownership. So the way that we make the decisions is to maximize some object, which is this, but it could be different than this. And how this was divided, how, this came, how we, if we take the sum of these two, how that was divided just makes no difference. You have $100, you're going to split it some way. And you're going to be splitting it to, you know, to maximize this. And that's it. Okay. All right.
okay, we can also ask for this economy to grow. That doesn't bind. Um, I'm not going to compare regimes very quickly. I actually feel I need to end at 3, correct, for this. And I'd like to end at 3 for this. And I want to get through the empirics and then start on a completely different topic. So uh, let me just take you through the intuition of the following results, which is really what you need. Okay, So um, if you were to compare regimes, just so that we understand, of course, men consume more under no rights than under equal rights for the same amount of capital. And women, of course, are better off for the same amount of capital under equal rights than they are under no rights. Uh, it turns out, and this is a functional form result, that there is greater investment in kids under equal rights than under no rights. And I can explain to you maybe a bit later why it is a functional form result rather than a strong implication of the, th of the theory. What I want you to understand is that the main tension that is going to exist between these two regimes is not just how uh, the women do, because you know, it's, it has to do with how men feel when they're making investments in their children. So when men are giving bequests to their kids, it's actually very hard work for them to make their daughters better off. Suppose I give my daughter, OK, Isabel, you're my daughter. I'm going to give you an extra unit of capital, OK? And you take it to the marriage market. It doesn't change your marital prospects. You still marry the same guy. You get married. And, but you have an extra unit of capital than you did before, OK? How does that extra unit of capital make you better off? Well, in this model, it's very crude, but it makes a point kind of easily. Your consumption doesn't increase. You're stuck at sea lower bar. So are you still better off because I gave you more capital? I'm your mom or your dad. I'm your dad. OK, it's hard. I'm your dad. I gave you an extra unit of capital. Does that make you better off? Your consumption is stuck. The right answer is yes. So, so let's, yes, it makes you better off because it makes your children better off and your grandchildren, et cetera. So you're happy because you know it's made. But I can't make you directly better off. All I can, the only way I can make you better off is in the you know, you, like loosely speaking, the quality of your kids, the happiness of your kids. That's the only way I get to make you better off. If I give my boy an extra unit of capital, part of that's going to go into his consumption, and part of that's going to go to his children. The part that goes to his children makes, again, the wife better off. The part that goes to his consumption doesn't touch his wife. So when you want to make a girl better off, it's hard, because it's only through, it's harder. You can only do it via her children. When you want to make a boy better off, it's more direct. You're making him better off via his consumption and his children. So this is you know, a very stark way of putting it, but you can just think of more general ideas on which this would be true. When there's more prospects for a boy than there is for a girl. When there's more uses for that capital. Okay? And in particular, this is what's happening to a, woman, a girl's utility, if you'd like, versus a boy's utility as the capital stock increases exogenously. They're both going up. Obviously, because they're richer, and all of them care about their kids, so both utilities are going up. But the utility of the boy is going up by more than the utility of the girl. And in fact, this is expanding over time, the difference between VH and VW. And now I want to do uh, the politi co political economy and comp stats in five minutes. So we'll see if we can do that. Okay? So this is, but this is really kind of the meat of the paper, so I, I want to make sure that you get the basic ideas. I'm going to do a very crude political economy model, and then we can talk about it later in terms of thinking about how to make it more sophisticated. The crudeness of the political economy model is I'm going to ask each generation of men, do you prefer the patriarchal regime or the equal rights regime? And by prefer, I mean if you were going to live in a regime forever and all your descendants were going to live in a regime forever, would you prefer today to be in that patriarchal regime forever? Or would you prefer to switch to equal rights? And as long as you say no, I'm going to say, that, as long as you say you prefer patriarchy, I'm going to say the reform hasn't occurred. The second that you tell me that you prefer equal rights, I'm going to say the reform has occurred. Why is this a simplification? What, what, like if you are a political economy person, you would see saying, well, blah, blah. So wh why is this a simpl simplification? It's not myopia. It's not myopia. Uh, it, I mean, maybe myopia is the right, uh, not a bad word for it, but maybe spell it out rather than say it with a word. It's as though they're committed to a decision forever, even though 
I know that I'm giving them a choice next generation in the model. Okay? And in particular, what I'm not allowing them to have is that option value of saying, you know what, we're going to stay in patriarchy now, <coughs> but you know, my son's generation is going to take care of it. They're going to make this reform. So that option value is missing. And I can talk later on, for those of you who are interested in political economy, about how you would solve a dynamic political economy model. But basically, we're changing a dynamic political economy model, not to a static one, because they're taking all the future utilities into account, but it's as though they're being faced with a choice once and for all. OK, so in that sense, it's kind of you know, cheating on the political economy side. OK, so now I want to take you through three comp stats that I promised you. Now you know when a decision is going to occur. The first one is simply to, I, I guess I should introduce uh, some, uh, what the variables are. I'm going to look at the, uh, the value function of a husband under the no rights regime, the patriarchal regime, relative to the value of being a husband in the equal rights regime. And what's missing here is the argument as a function of K, okay? As a function of the capital stock, okay? Um, remember that capital stock is going to be increasing over time, so this is an interesting thing to look at. Okay? And what I want you to understand is that it is non-monotonic. It first goes up, and then it goes down. So, uh, when will the reform occur? The reform would occur at K-star. That's when you're exactly indifferent between the two regimes, and thereafter, you, the economy is going to keep on growing, and you actually per strictly prefer to be under equal rights. So we're going to call this moment in time the moment when the re reform occurs. Why is it non-monotonic? The reason that it's non-monotonic is that when you're very poor, like really poor, okay, then you know you're not getting. I mean, I mean, sometimes you're not getting that much out of patriarchy. Your wife is consuming very little. You're consuming very little. Yeah, there's this inefficiency in the welfare of your boys and girls, but you know, like your boys are here and your girls are here, okay? So but no big deal, okay? And then if I give you an extra unit of capital, so if I take you from here to here, what happens is that under patriarchy, you get to keep that whole unit of capital. Yes, it's true you're going to give a bit of it to your kids, but you have a really high marginal utility of consumption because you're really poor, okay? Whereas under uh, equal rights, you would have to split that extra unit of capital between you and your wife. And right now, when you're really poor, you really care about that, okay? So you're going to actually be more in favor of patriarchy when you get richer than you were when you were really poor. Because now it's that, having that extra property right, being able to grab your wife's property and eat some of it, it's really important because now there's more property to grab. So it's like a good system. It's like if everyone's poor, who cares? But now we're a little bit richer, now we can grab a bit more. It's even better to be in patriarchy. And that's going to continue till the economy becomes some certain level of richness. We'll call it K-hat. And thereafter, uh, it starts to decrease the difference. So the utility being in, of course, under no rights goes up, under equal rights goes up, but the utility of being under equal rights is going up faster than under no rights. And that's what is causing this. And why is that? And that's because it's now hurting you. Like, you know, what would you like to be able to do, like at a point, like at this capital stock over here? What would you like to do? if you could do it. What you'd like to do is you'd like to say to your son-in-law, OK, I'm going to give my wife 10 more units of consumption. And I want you to do the same with my daughter. And we should all sign these contracts. That might be an interesting thing to look at. And in some sense, what this model is doing is saying, one, you can't write those contracts. But two, I'm not looking at that reform. I'm looking at a more drastic reform. Because you could think about, all sorts of little reforms here. They'd be all be happy to do that. They can't sign those contracts, so they don't. And what they're not yet willing to do is to say, I'm willing to give half of my consumption to my wife if my son-in-law does the same with my daughter. They're not yet willing to go that far. They have to wait till their, the economy is r this rich before they're willing to do that. And then they do that, and they do that via giving women equal rights. That's the assumption. That, that what equal rights does is that it gives the women the right to, to make that allocation decision with equal weight as her husband. And again, that's just stark. You could put some other weight. It doesn't really matter. OK, so that's why this is concave. And what this would say is that the reform happens here. Let me talk you through fertility. Why does fertility matter in this economy? Well, here are, let's look at them already as states. 
here's a state with uh, high fertility, and here's a state with lower fertility. They have the same shapes, but as you can see, reform happens under uh, a lower level of K star when the fertility is low than when it's high. Okay, why does it happen uh, sooner? Why does it happen sooner? Yeah, good question. I don't remember the answer. Sorry? You're giving more weight to the growth total of your children or under the more control. Right. What, what's going to happen is that you're, yeah, you're giving your children more and because you're richer. You're giving your children more. And the disparity in your children's welfare is therefore happening sooner. So you're getting quicker to a point where... Um, the disparity in the welfare between your boys and your girls is bothersome to you. Furthermore, remember, you're, you know, another way of saying the same thing is that you're consuming more already. For any level of K here, you're consuming more. Why are you consuming more? Because you have fewer children to give bequests to. So th you can think about it either way. Either you can be giving the same amount of bequests, this bigger bequests for more consumption, or for the same level of bequests, you could be consuming more. Either case, that inefficiency has grown. And that's why you're going to do things sooner. The, the other thing to notice is that not only will reform happen at a lower level of wealth, it's also going to happen faster in the sense that any initial capital stock that you get to, capital accumulation will be quicker in economy with lower fertility. So that's true basically of any uh, growth model that you write down. It's also true here. And then the last one has to do with the wife, wife's welfare. Let's look at two states. One of them has a high C lower bar, and the other one has a lower C lower bar. The one with a lower C lower bar is actually preferred. It makes patriarchy even better when you're really poor. You can give less to your wife. Yay, patriarchy, OK? Because you get to eat more as a husband. So you're quite happy about it when you're poor. But as you get richer, OK, now you're bothered by it sooner. Why? Why are you bothered by it sooner? Anyone who's falling asleep. Why are you bothered by it sooner? Why, why, why are you going to be more inclined to scrap the system sooner? Yeah, you're, you're, you're treating your wife worse, which you couldn't care less about. You're eating more, yay. But this, your son-in-law is doing the same thing with your daughter, and that's bothering you. So although it makes you better off, it also makes, at the beginning when you're poor, it also makes you scrap the system sooner. So that's why you scrap the system sooner. OK. So we, it's, you know, I'm taking you so much to a model. This always happens to me. Um, it's a robust a whole bunch of stuff. I can explain a lot of things. And I think I'm going to uh, take you through the empirics in eight minutes. OK? Yes. Why would one care about his daughter but not about his wife? Why not? Yeah, you know, so, yeah, you're not the first guy who asked me this. I, for some reason, men seem to have this problem of conceiving that you care asymmetrically about your spouse than your children, whereas women don't seem to have this problem, or maybe they do. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you don't, there's nothing in your utility functions that says treat your spouse like you treat your kids. One is, first of all, I mean, we could do evolutionary arguments. We can do evolutionary, we can do evolutionary arguments to say, why it would make a lot more sense to care more about your kids than your spouse, OK? Your spouse is not genetically related to you. Uh, I mean, now you're taking me to theory. Go ahead. But the reason we don't have you care about your wife to understand why I have that, it's a very stark assumption, is because with log preferences, if you care about your wife, in particular, if you care about your wife's utility, even if you put very little weight on it, what will happen is that the utility levels of boys and girls are going to remain parallel to one another. That's why. It, the result will go away. That doesn't mean that the result is knife edge and that it only exists if you care about, if you don't care about your spouse at all. That would be terrible. It's to solve, you need logs, and logs brings you to this result. So it, it, you know, what would happen is that your wife's consumption would grow at the same rate as your consumption. It would always be below, but it'd be growing at the same rate. And then we won't have an overturning of the systems. So you either need to change preferences and go away from logs, and then you can care about your spouse, and that will work. So there's a whole family of utility functions. So it's in the paper if you want to look at the whole family of utility functions for which it will work, and a family of utility functions for which it won't.
But then you wouldn't be able to solve this model analytically. I'm not sure I understand it. You care about your own utility and your kid's utility. I don't think that, I, that so that's pretty standard. So but the critical assumption is not that you place zero weight on your wife, it's that you place different weight on your wife and your daughter. Um, is, is that what you're saying? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I actually didn't play around with that. I think that would be a necessary ingredient. But you know what? I never thought about that because I couldn't solve the model for anything but logs. And when I was playing around with it, I was just playing around to make sure that it's not a knife head solution. So what are the properties of a utility function that I would have to have for these things not to grow in parallel? Okay, but uh, I, I don't want to say that about the dot. I, and I think you're right, but I'm not 100% sure. No, nope, that's a good point. Okay. All right, so let me take you very quickly through married women's property rights. This is a variable that's coded from Gettys and Luke's, and actually they took it from someone else, but I'm taking it from them. And basically it's nice to take something from someone else, and you should always do it when you can, not just because it's less work, but because you can't be accused of then putting the variables in a particular way so as to suit your own purposes. And in particular here it does matter because they have to go through legal treatises to remit to determine when a property act gave women management and control of two things. One is their earnings and the other is their uh, estate. Okay, so they code those. Uh, and then they use a, a dummy variable, which I'm going to use, which is called both, which is when women get control of their separate estates and earnings, both of these rights. So we're going to have this dummy variable both. When this happens, it's going to be zero otherwise. There's a lot of uh, time variation. There is some clumping, as you can see. The other thing, people differ on this, I believe you have to show your data. I mean, in a way that people can see it in some sort of scatter plot. Here it's very easy. It's just 48 states. But in general, you've got to show your data. I, I can't stand it when people don't show me their data. So here's the states. This is the timing of women's property rights. The first state to have both was Massachusetts in 1846. The last states were... Um, Florida, Arizona, New Mexico, and Louisiana. I think Louisiana was 1980. Okay, so fairly recent. But we don't go that far. We stop in 1920. And that's because what these things mean, once they're just on the books, it's, it's a whole different kettle of fish. So we're not going there. We're stopping this analysis in 1920. And by 1920, all states but four have granted women property rights. So states like Florida, Arizona, New Mexico, and Louisiana are going to have zeros throughout. And then the other ones are going to be switching from zeros to one as we change their system. Sorry? Yeah, I'm going to take care of all those things to, to the extent possible. Yes. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of things going on here. So it's just a visual thing for you to understand what states are doing when. The, the, the most recent one, the, the earliest ones that are the darkest and the lightest one are the ones that are in most recent times. The other thing the model needs is uh, fertility. Uh, the sense, uh, luckily, the theory is not really concerned with fertility. It's really concerned about kids who are getting married, because that's when you care about your, your daughter's welfare, respect to her husband, uh, and which is good for us. And so uh, I'm going to be looking at, uh, m since we don't have good measures of how many kids people had till 1900s, I'm going to be looking at ratios of children to women, which is what demographers normally do when they don't have good data on uh, household uh, family sizes. So I'm just going to look at the number of kids. And I'm going to look at kids who's, who've made it to the, basically have made it to the age of marriage, which means that they didn't die before the age of 10. Okay, so you can quibble about how old people should be in the we do the robustness. But basically, I'm looking at kids from 10 to 19 and women to 20 to 39. I'm going to be looking at that ratio as my measure of fertility at the state level. Throughout, I'm only going to be looking at whites. Why only whites and not blacks? Because a well, portion of this time, they're, they're slaves. But that's not the main reason. The main reason is that it's white men who are making the decisions at this point. So we want to look at the variables that are affecting white men that they care about, which is their family size, rather than, say, black family size. 
this is what that for, I'm going to call that fertility variable, fertility 10, just to remember that it's kids 10 and over. And this is what it looks like at any point, any decade. I'm going to be using decadal census data. So I just want you to look at the states. Uh, this is the variation that they exist. And as you can see, it's going down over time. You know, ch uh, children's size is going down, basically. It's not that survival is going down, but it's just the ch uh, family size is going down over time. And there's a lot of variation across states. So this is a bus plot with states as the unit of observation? This is states as the unit of observation. And I'm just giving you the standard, uh, the standard uh, deviations and uh, the maximum and the mins. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. What did you think they were? I didn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. The black dots are, yes. That's, that's it. That's why they're symmetric. It's a standard deviation, not a constant. No. No, no, no. No, it's a standard deviation, just to give you an idea of what the data looks like. OK. There's other sources of variation uh, across states. Uh, someone was bringing up that some states were not states. I forget who it was. Someone over there. Yes. You were bringing, some states were not states during at least part of this period, and they were part of territories. Uh, I'm going to control for their territorial status. And in particular, when I look at state fixed effects, I'm going to be giving states territorial fixed effects if they belong to a territory at the beginning of this analysis. No, no, no. I mean, um, I don't know what exactly. Uh, being a territory allowed you to do or didn't, and I could not find anything. There are territories that did reforms before they became states. So it was not impossible to reform. And all I do is then just control for your territorial status. There's, that's not the only variation across states. There's, legisl uh, there's laws. Some states, 12 of them, have uh, equity chancery courts. So aside from common law, which is governing most of the US states, some of them have an equity system. And the equity system is something that was invented later on by the English, which was uh, if, if you know, common law was too um, rigid, you could appeal to a chancery court. So these courts could be used to contract around some of these rigidities. rigidities. They could be made of, use of by, primarily by wealthy women. I end up not finding an effect for this, but I do control for it. Yeah, it's like you would be able to protect your daughter's property by saying her uncle, her brother, say, would be the custodian, maybe, of the property. And then now you have to rely on the brother being a nice guy. But you know th that was one way to, to maybe keep some, especially if you had a lot of property. Most people don't have a lot of property. But if you had a lot of property, keep some property out of the hands of husbands. Um, some states, and this is going to be our see lower bar variation, some states had a community property law, which was inherited either from, the Spain, from Spain or from France. Okay? What's different about community property law? Well, marital property is jointly owned, and when the husband dies, the wife gets half of the marital assets. She's guaranteed that, rather than a third of the marital assets, which is what happens under common law. So I'm going to... I'm. Uh, the other half go to the children or to anyone, no, anyone he wants to give it to, actually. Oh. Anyone he wants to give it to, I think. Is like a cap on, at most, she can receive? No, it's at minimum. Oh, I see. It's but a he min. Can, he, can he could leave everything to her, OK? I actually think that under Napoleonic law, actually, you have to treat all your kids equally. And think there's some, there's some uh, more restrictions. But in terms of being a widow, if you die, minimum a half for her, OK? So I'm going to code this as C bar. Now, there's no death and widowhood and anything like that in the model. So again, it's very crude what I'm doing. I'm just saying husband's dying is not completely unheard of, uh, especially during this time period. And this is a system that guaranteed you a, base, a better base than the other system. Uh, when I do state fixed effects, the only way you can look at the importance of a law system is if a law system changed. Otherwise, it's absorbed in the state fixed effect. And so there's only three states that changed over this time period. So we're really going to lose all power, uh, just to warn you. OK. So uh, I just want to, uh, Steve, I need some guidance. It's 306. Excellent. OK. Blame him? OK. <laughs> See? That's why you need guidance. Okay. So. <laughs> 
All right, so the first thing I do is just to, do, I'm going to take you quickly, because this is boring. I think if you, if you could do too many details at this point. So I'll show you that. This is a basic correlation that Gettys and Lukes found. This is wealth per capita. Wealth is all forms, that's also a very difficult variable, wealth at the state level. Uh, but they basically, Gettys and Lukes do all sorts of transformations. I'm using their variable. I'm just reproducing their basic results, which is that there's a positive correlation between reform at the state level and wealth per capita at the state level. Just to be clear what I'm doing, because I realize I went a little bit fast, uh, I'm looking at decades from 1850 through 1920. So a state is going to appear at most, whatever number of times that is, eight. Uh, and then, so, so one observation for each decade. And you're going to be coded as you've had the reform if you've had it before that year. Okay, and otherwise you're going to be coded as not having had the reform. And there were a few hands, yeah. Yeah, no, we'd love to. I mean, we, meaning I and myself, would love to, but there's none of that. And then I would have really gone for a different model. I would have had distributions in there because it had a heterogeneity in there. But there are there. Yeah. Thank you so much for saying that's a point I try to make. That you know, if you're going to have a distribution out there, then the non-monotonicity plays a big role. And now we're going to be sensitive to political economy. How do we do the right political economy when we have a distribution of wealth? That's my excuse for the results not going through. But in any case, uh, that aside, yeah, there's, the data doesn't exist, and I wish it did. Yeah. So yeah, and also I think that's also a useful thing to keep in mind. In general, you don't shouldn't put too much more in your model than what your data can handle. You know, in the sense that you know, what's the point of putting a distribution if it's not going to be there? You just spend an extra half hour. Uh, deriving some stuff. OK, so this is just to show you the basic result. The next thing I just want to show you, this is our probits, by the way. Um, and then I put in fertility and the importance of wealth per capita disappears. Being a territory means you're less likely to have a reform, ceteris paribus. Having a community system makes you much less likely to have a reform. Having, uh, the, this is an equity court, and the omitted variable is a common law system without an equity court. Um, OK. This is, uh, US, so I'm going to move right away to um, state fixed effects. This is the US in 1850, OK? All of these were all states, the pinks, already. These were not states. So I am amazingly bad at American geography. So inside Oregon, I know there's Oregon. And there's Washington. And then I always forget the, the uh, other one. Idaho. Idaho, great, thank you. OK. so. Those three states are going to get the Oregon Territory fixed effects. There's this 12 states in here, in these masses, that are or, uh, territories, either organized or unorganized, and they're each going to get their territory fixed effect. But otherwise, you're going to get Indiana gets its own fixed effect. OK, so that's what we're doing when we're doing fixed effects. And now you can see again, as the theory predicts, states which have uh, higher fertility, see reform happen uh, later. Uh, wealth or wealth per capita squared, it doesn't matter. Territories do things later. And once we, as I said, there's only three states from which to identify once you have community fix, once you have state fixed effects. Here's the same thing as before, except now I'm putting in regional dummies rather than state fixed effects so that you can see once again the importance of community. And lastly, I'm just going to talk very quickly about proxying for, for, for fertility by using child mortality. The child mortality data stinks. Why would you think child mortality might be an instrument for um, fertility, uh, fertility 10? It's because, well, that's surviving fertility, and it just directly enters in there, OK? So the surviving kids per woman is the number of kids born per woman by times 1 minus the child mortality rate. So there's no doubt that it's going to affect it. You don't know if it's negatively or positively. Uh, in fact, without time dummies, the correlation is positive, but with time dummies, the correlation is negative. What does that mean? It means that take a cross-section of states in any decade, states which had uh, higher child mortality had fewer kids. Okay? Uh, that's what it means. Okay. So that's what you would expect. Fewer surviving, fewer surviving kids. It's surviving to the age of 10, yes. I, I, I really do mean to see, say, survival, uh, survival fertility each but, time. But what about, did they have more 
I don't know. And uh, yeah, there is this infant death registries, and that's what the authors, either Tamora and someone and someone, are doing. Uh, but they don't really come into line till 1910 or so for anything but a handful of states. My theory doesn't care about your fertility. So actually, I don't need to know it. I need you to make it to marriage. So in some sense, I, I, don't, I don't have to have a. So when I say fertility, I really do mean survival fertility. It's <laughs> making it some chance, of, a strong chance of making it to being marriageable age. Otherwise, it just is irrelevant. No. The, um, if you don't make it to the age of 10, you're not getting a bequest. You're dying. And if you're a girl, you're not getting ill-treated by your husband. So in, in a model, say, which wouldn't, in which all girls died, you wouldn't reform the system. I mean, that, that's a little bit crazy. But it's just because you don't care about how there's no son-in-laws to badly treat your daughters. Your daughters are dead. So you, in this system, you care because your son-in-laws are not being as generous to your daughters as you would like. And when you try to make them better off, this, the patriarchal system is an implicit tax on your bequests and your ability to increase your daughter's utility. Yeah, no, no, this is a, a vaster level of simplification. There are, there's, a, there's year fixed effects throughout, so common shocks will be taken care of that. Obviously, we can't have state cross year fixed effects, so we would get rid of our variable of interest. So to the extent that this is affect, of course, this is not affecting all states the same, but the, t there are certain things like recessions or financial panics, to some extent, the civil war, yeah. Um, ask me when I get to the slide because I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, I could look at the, I, the easiest one to look at is the probit. Uh, uh, but I don't have this, I don't remember the standard deviation, let's say of a fertility 10 to give you any sort of, so yeah. Uh, okay, I have three minutes. To, can I, you let me go for three minutes, and then I'm happy to take questions during the break. Um, so I, I'm not going to take you through this very much. I, it's, it's really uh, a way to at least proxy for, the, for um, Fertility 10, and the results all go through. It doesn't take care of the endogeneity issue because you really still have to face, you know, why is there a correlation between, I mean, there's this mechanical correlation, but are the same forces that are giving vari rise to variation in, chi in, in child mortality also giving rise to variations in things that could be affecting directly our variable of interest, which is the reform of rights. And what I wanted to argue, and this is where I expect Steve to say something, because I do remember him saying something once on this, was that um, I want to at least rule out certain channels. Okay, and then these depend on partial correlations, and then I think he'll say something, but we'll see. Um, and I want, the channels I want to rule out is that if you think that this fertility, this mortality variable is really the, when it's proxying for fertility, that it's doing so because there's this omitted variable, suppose wealth, okay? Uh, that when we get wealthier, like somebody was saying, when we get educated, we care more about being good people. Maybe when we get wealthier, we find more room in our hearts to be, you know, to care about more people, okay? Well, and one, one way that this could be proxying would be that wealthier states would have lower infant mortality, and then we're really capturing the association between wealth, which is really badly measured, perhaps, or income, which is really badly measured, and, you know, and, and the propensity of reform. And what I want to tell you is that can't be it, and the reason it can't be it is because it's going in the opposite direction. It's not states who have low infant mortality that do the reforms first. It's states with Ceteris Paribus high infant mortality that do the reform first. So to whatever extent you think that there's a positive correlation between infant mortality and wealth, 
it's going, it's, th that would lead you to the wrong uh, theory. The other thing uh, is the influence of women, and I think this one is really important. So if you think that what this is really getting at is that states with low infant mortality are states where women have a lot more power of some sort, political power, bargaining power, and th that's what's showing up in the lower infant mortality, and there's reasons to believe that. In fact, there's a very nice paper in the QJE by Grant Miller, 2009, where he shows that the second that women, it's not the second, but basically a few months later after women get the vote at the state level, infant mortality falls and public spending on health goes up. So, you know, women having the vote makes a gigantic difference to what we see. Okay, so what you might think is that when you're seeing lower infant mortality, it's a reflection of women having more bargaining strength and that really it's women's bargaining strength that led to these reforms. And again, what I want to tell you is that correlation goes in the wrong direction. It's states with high infant mortality that you see these things change, ceteris paribus. It's not states with low infant mortality, okay? So those, both of those would go in the wrong uh, direction. I want to take you one minute through alternative hypothesis, in particular to, to talk about like the Dopke and Turtle. So is it schooling? And that was interesting to some of you. This is compulsory schooling. Um, you know, uh, I forgot, I forgot actually which variable this is. Let me take you through this one that I remember. Does the, the year in which compulsory schooling uh, was introduced, does that make reform more likely? So if it's introduced earlier, does reform happen earlier? And you can see the correlation is the wrong sign. Places that have compulsory schooling earlier actually have these reforms happen later. Is it women's? This is the fraction of women who are in primary school. This is the fraction of men that are in primary school. I think it's primary and secondary, or it might be just primary. As you can see, these, these coefficients don't matter at all. Other ideas of bargaining strength would be what's a fraction of women relative to men. Actually, this is a fraction of men relative to women. So a lot of people think that when women are scarce, we're talking about China, when women are scarce, they have more bargaining power. What this shows is that when the fraction of men to women is higher, it actually has no effect on the timing of reform, and it doesn't affect the uh, uh, statistical significance of, of, of fertility 10. This is also the same for the date of suffrage. If we look at the year in which women got suffrage, it has no explanatory value for thinking about when did women get property rights. 